I go and get you comfy. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about how I became an accidental author of over a dozen children's books. But first of all, I am much more comfortable speaking to people a lot smaller than you. So if you could sit on, your, on the floor with your hands in your lap, I'd be much happier. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I used to be a primary school teacher and you're just really big. <laughs> Well, today we're talking about turning points. And the turning point in my family's life was when we were lucky enough to bring home our toddler after two major pioneering lung surgeries. <sighs> it was a really difficult time for us. But we made it through. <laughs> it was this turning point... <laughs> Thank you. It was this turning point that made me realise that I could help other children and their families who were going through what we had been through in far worse circumstances than ours had been in. And ours was pretty bad at the time. And it was when I realised I could help ease other children's fears and anxieties by being that little bit more prepared, if possible. I'll give you a bit of background first. About 12 and a half years ago, I went for a scan with my husband Daniel to find out if our first child was going to be a girl or a boy. And the lady said, oh, there was something, but she wasn't sure what it was, and we needed to see a specialist. So a few days later, we saw a specialist consultant in a yellow room with a sofa and a painting, and then we realised that this room wasn't a room that everyone could use. We found out that our daughter had a condition called congenital cystic adenematoid malformation, or CCAM for short. It was rare. Of course it was. <laughs> and a condition where a lump forms in a lung and it can grow or stay in the same size. So the next few months were a series of scans to see if the lump was changing, and thankfully it didn't. But no one was quite sure what would happen when she was born. Well, the day arrived, and I went into labour. And my husband, Daniel, my friend Vicky and I trooped up to the hospital, with Daniel convinced for some reason that we'd be able to have a Chinese takeaway for delivery. He was wrong. <laughs> I was eight and a half centimetres dilated. So, a little while later, <laughs> with straps and monitors and no sign of the takeaway, she arrived. Thankfully, her lungs opened successfully, so the surgeons who were on standby weren't needed. Neither were the beeping, flashing machines or the other emergency paraphernalia in the room. She was here. She was gorgeous. <laughs> we took Josephine home on my birthday. It was the best present. And having had so much medicalisation of my pregnancy and her birth, we went home alone with no one, really. Wasn't anyone going to tell us what to do? We'd been advised to look out for symptoms of the CCAM when we went home and carried on for a few months. I convinced myself she wasn't too symptomatic and that she was putting on being out of breath when she crawled and toddled about. I mean, we were lucky. We knew what to expect. We knew we needed an operation in the future, and my husband was amazing. <laughs> he researched online, he joined forums, and he spoke to Dr Kelly, who was our consultant, about various options to deal with this operation. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> okay, yeah. We knew that this lump could turn into something nasty in the future. We knew it had to come out. But were there any alternatives to three, four-inch incisions down her chest? How would she feel when she was older? Self-conscious in a bikini on the beach? She looked perfect on the outside. Was it really necessary? Well, yes, it was. And Dr Kelly was wonderful. He found an alternative way, a new way, a pioneering way, keyhole surgery with no huge scars, a first for the Royal Alex here in Brighton. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we went for the CT scan for her first operation and they discovered a cyst on her other lung. Great. Attached to her diaphragmatic aorta. So quite a complicated additional problem. <laughs> and we, to be honest, I just shut down. I couldn't deal with it anymore. 
and left my husband to get on for it, with it. It was just too scary to deal with. And when we went for our pre-op appointment at the hospital and had to look at some pictures while Josephine was playing, I realised, as a mummy, as a nursery nurse and as a primary school teacher, that I needed her to be really well prepared for this, really at ease with what was going to happen in the hospital, particularly as she was old enough to understand what would be going on. It would be hard enough for Daniel and I, let alone if she was nervous and uncertain of the procedures and the equipment. We spent hours playing hospitals at home with role play and nurses' kits and doctors' kits and puppets and soft toys. We read lots of illustrated storybooks, but there was nothing that showed the actual environment she would be in. So I wrote her her own storybook based on photos taken at the hospital, and we read it every night for weeks. She knew what all the machines would do, the noises they would make, a bit like old MacDonald has a farm, but in a hospital. <laughs> well, Josephine was the first child to have this operation at the Royal Alex. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Mohammed, and Mr. Parikh from Birmingham Children's, wow, they were wonderful. And I can't thank them and the old staff at the NHS for their dedication and brilliance. Honestly. <laughs> What would we do without the outstanding NHS? But that's a talk for another time. <laughs> I will never, ever forget walking Josephine down to theatre as she drove along in a little pink electric toy car. <laughs> I sat her on my lap on the anaesthetist trolley, snuggled Mrs Rabbit up with her, gave her my biggest smile and sang You Are My Sunshine as she went to sleep. <laughs> It was the most unbelievably difficult thing I had ever had to do. And that's when I fell to pieces. Sorry. We'd done all we could. We just had to sit back and wait for the surgeons to do their job. We expected this operation to last about seven hours. And after four and a half, I just couldn't wait any longer. I had to find out if it was going OK. So I started to walk down the corridor. And there was Dr Callie at the nurses' station. Why was he there? Why wasn't he in theatre? The only thing I could think was that something had gone catastrophically wrong and my legs just went from under me. He saw me and he ran down saying, Helen, she's fine. She's in recovery, it's OK. And he scooped me up, took me to Daniel, who was waiting in the parents' room, and we just hugged and cried with relief. She was fine. Whew. Sorry, that was the hard bit. Great. Gets better now. Here we go. <laughs> <sighs> so, once in intensive care, she was fine. She was better than fine. And in actual fact, rather like her daddy, she was hungry. <laughs> she ate and ate. She was incredible, not phased by the machines, the tubes, the noises, anything. It had all been in her storybook. She knew what to expect. It was fine. And after a few days in intensive care, blowing bubbles to help her lungs, finger painting in her cot and sharing storybooks, we couldn't contain her any longer. <laughs> and she was off, racing down corridors with her daddy and I, chasing her with the chest strain <laughs> on wheels on a trolley. Oh, my word. Believe me, she was fast. <laughs> after CT scans and X-rays, we were allowed to go home after days, not the weeks that we'd been expecting. It was amazing. And when we were at home, for the next six months, waiting for her body to be strong enough for the next operation, we carried on reading the storybook, put on brave faces, encouraged her to be proud of the tiny stars on her chest, not scars, stars, and we waved at Dr Kelly every time we went past the hospital. The day of the second operation came, and she skipped in. It was an adventure, bless her look, <laughs> holding her little doctor's bag. It was an adventure, but really the norm for her. And this time, having expected to be in for days, we were home within 18 hours. The operation was a success. It was extraordinary. It was over. <laughs> a few tiny stars and that was it. And then Dr. Callie spoke to us about her quick recovery. 
The nurses and consultants had seen our storybook and they thought it was lovely. He said he thought her recovery time had been partly lessened due to the preparation we'd done at home with this storybook. He wondered if we would consider sharing it with other children and their families as he thought that it could make a difference. And that was when we realised that my experience as a primary school teacher, being able to explain things simply and clearly, could actually make a difference to other children and their families. We could influence and change the way they brought children in for an operation, make it as positive as possible and reduce the chance of passing on any adult ingrained fears, and it would help the NHS if it reduced time spent in hospital. So I decided to go for it and not go back to being a teacher. Just so you know, Josephine is fine. <laughs> and she's here today. She's up there somewhere with my husband, Daniel. Hello! <laughs> So this is where he comes in, monkey. Daniel enlisted our friend Alex, and they walked 100 miles of the South Downs Way to produce, to raise enough money to produce 10,000 copies of the first storybook. That's 10,000 families to help. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, here they are. Coming back from their walk. <laughs> My friend designed the layout of the book. Mon um, Dan not Monkey designed Daniel. Daniel designed Monkey. <laughs> and we had him made. And it rocketed from there. The Royal Alex asked if we would write Monkey has a blood test, because that's a really difficult procedure for some children to go through. And actually, I've got a story about that, funnily enough, of a little boy who had had a really traumatic time having blood taken with his mum, and it had taken ages. And subsequently, he developed a phobia when his next appointment was due, he read Monkey Has a Blood Test every night for a week with his mummy, took his monkey puppet with him to the hospital, and, you know, they didn't even have to pay for parking. They were in and out that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> monkey and I have met loads of people across the UK now. We always thoroughly research all of our books, don't we? We always work with specialist healthcare providers and psychologists to make sure we're using the right terminology but I start every book as though I'm just a mummy with no experience. So I make it simple to, under to, simple to understand and it's easy to explain with no jargon. Everything's really visual and it's ever so humbling to see it working because now we've helped over 1.2 million children. <laughs> <laughs> We've got 12 books published, with 72 or more on our list, so that will keep us really busy. <laughs> and we know that there really is a need for realistic health literacy and education, particularly for families who have younger children, for families who have English as a second language, and for families with children on the autistic spectrum. Although, having said that, my auntie lent an operation book to a friend of hers in her 70s, she was a bit nervous about going into hospital, and it reassured her too. <laughs> We've had adventures all across the UK. We met Kath from the NHS, who commissioned us to make an NHS Explorers pack. This went to over 19,000 primary and special schools in the UK, introducing the National Health Service and how to use it wisely. We visited ITV Signpost, who donated British Sign Language translation to a series of films along with ITFC, who audio described them. This made them accessible to hundreds more children. We've developed signposts to services. To put on your fridge so that if an adult is unwell at home, a child knows who to call, and that's so important. We've got, well, we've created education packs, such as the Emergency Department Guide for When You're in A&E, and that's making a huge difference to children's patient experience. The benefit of using our resources has even been in a couple of CQC reports, which is amazing. We made a film with Harvey's Gang, the charity, talking about what happens to your blood after a blood test. We've been to the dentist here in Brighton with Mr O'Keefe, and we've got hundreds of free downloads on our website, from tummy aches to advent calendars, asthma plans to head injuries. The monkeys even started school. <laughs> 
And when my dear dad was in hospital and really poorly, I wrote Monkey Visits Grandpa to explain to our little boy Buzzy and our daughter Josephine what a grown-up's hospital was like because it's so different to a children's one. Buzzy was a bit worried that he'd catch something. <laughs> it's all about being prepared, knowing what to expect and what will happen next. Monkey and I have been lucky to meet so many people and it's only through sharing our stories that I now understand how many people face this type of thing every single day. So I am dedicated <laughs> to helping children face new things with honesty, positivity and simplicity.